Hey everyone, it's Masood. Welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 3 High Yield Facts Part 2. If you already watched Part 1, welcome back. And if you're brand new to my channel, my name is Masood Muhammad. I'm an emergency medicine physician and I create a ton of high yield content for medical students and residents, including USMLE and Comlex Prep and videos like this. So be sure to subscribe to receive all of my latest content and be sure to check out my website as well, medschoolmoose.com. There's a ton of great content on there also. That being said, let's jump right into it. What is the most specific test for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis? This is going to be sweat chloride concentrations. This is actually something that is testable back on USMLE Step 1 again, and like I said, some of this content comes back around for Step 2 CK and for Step 3. But the most specific test for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis is going to be sweat chloride concentrations, typically greater than 60 mL equivalents per liter. Number's not as important, but just know that's the most specific test. Meconium ileus occurs in about blank percent of patients. This is about 10% of patients, 10% of neonates. Some of the symptoms that we want to be on the lookout for with meconium ileus are things like abdominal distension at birth, failure to pass meconium, and bilious vomiting. If we see those things, that's very concerning for meconium ileus occurring in about 10% of newborns. What is the confirmatory test for diabetes in pregnancy? This is going to be the 3-hour 100-gram oral glucose tolerance test. This is actually the most specific test for the diagnosis of diabetes in pregnancy. That being said, what is the most sensitive test to diagnose diabetes in pregnancy? This is going to be the 1-hour 50-gram oral glucose tolerance test. So be sure that you know those differences, and be sure, again, that you're reading these questions very carefully to make sure you're not getting tripped up on test day. Moving on now, what is Reynolds Pentad? You may remember this from medical school, again, from step one. Reynolds Pentad is the clinical presentation for ascending cholangitis, and the symptoms are jaundice, fever, abdominal pain, altered mental status, and shock. Again, that is Reynolds Pentad, very concerning for ascending cholangitis. In real life, not all patients present like this, not all patients read the textbook, but for the exam, you want to know that these are associated with cholangitis. All right, I'll throw you guys a gimme here. What is Rovzing sign? This is one I think that we all learn in medical school. Rovzing sign is palpation in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen increases pain felt in the right lower quadrant. And this is something that is classically seen in acute appendicitis. What is the most common type of hernia in men? This is actually going to be an indirect inguinal hernia. Remember, these hernias protrude via the internal inguinal ring, and they come out lateral to the inferior epigastric vessel. So really important to know all of those different things. Most common type of hernia in men, indirect inguinal hernia. It's protruding through the internal inguinal ring, and it comes out lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. All high-yield information. That being said, what is the most common type of hernia in women? This one may be a little bit of a trick, but it's the same thing. It's an indirect inguinal hernia. It's the most common type of hernia in both men and women. What is the most accurate test to diagnose Dubin-Johnson syndrome? This is going to be a liver biopsy. Remember Dubin-Johnson syndrome, this is defective excretion of conjugated bilirubin from hepatocytes. Dubin-Johnson syndrome, the liver has that classic black appearance. Liver biopsy is the most accurate test to diagnose it. Really no treatment required for Dubin-Johnson syndrome. It's fairly benign, but just know most accurate test to diagnose it is a liver biopsy. Some neonatology here. When do symptoms of cocaine withdrawal present in neonates? This is typically within the first 48 hours of life. Same thing for amphetamine and alcohol withdrawal. So amphetamine withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, and cocaine withdrawal in neonates typically seen in the first 48 hours of life. Now, when do symptoms of methadone withdrawal present in neonates? This is typically somewhere around the first 96 hours of life. Methadone has a longer half-life of somewhere around 24 hours, so the symptoms can present a little bit later, first 96 hours of life. That being said, symptoms can present up to two weeks after birth, so be sure that you know that timeline. Velcro rails are characteristic of what condition? Velcro rails are characteristic of interstitial lung disease, most notably pulmonary fibrosis. These Velcro rails, as they're described, are these dry sounding rails. They kind of sound like Velcro separating, which is how they get the name. And if you see a description like that, just know that is seen in interstitial lung disease, specifically pulmonary fibrosis is the big one. How is response to treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis monitored? This is monitored with closure of the increased anion gap. Anyone that's treated DKA, this is the important thing to know. When it comes to monitoring response to treatment, we're not looking at things like serum glucose levels or ketone levels or anything like that. It is closure of that elevated anion gap is how we're monitoring treatment of DKA. Recurrent staphylococcus skin infections is seen in blank. This is seen in hyper-IgE syndrome. 
Next one now, what is the best initial therapy for anaphylaxis? This is going to be IM epinephrine. And the important thing to know here is that it is IM epinephrine. It's not sub-Q, it's not IV or anything else like that. It is IM epinephrine. The dosing, not as important, but it is typically 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. You don't need to know the dosing as much, but you do need to know the route of administration. So again, best initial therapy for anaphylaxis, I am epinephrine. What condition is transmitted by sand flies? Again, going back to those sketchy videos, going back to step one information, sand flies transmit leishmaniasis. Remember, this is a protozoal infection caused by the parasite leishmania, and it is transmitted by sand flies. Moving on now, blank is the reversal agent for dabigatran. Again, I have seen this on other exams before. I've seen it on step one. You'll see it on step two, and you will see it again on step three. It's that weird monoclonal antibody, idarcizumab, is the reversal agent for dabigatran. What is the best initial management for unstable patients with supraventricular tachycardia? Hopefully my emergency medicine people watching know this one immediately. Best initial management for unstable SVT is going to be synchronized cardioversion. If you have a stable patient with SVT, you can try other things, vagal maneuvers, IV adenosine tends to be the mainstay of treatment, but if it's an unstable patient, we are skipping all of that. We are going straight to the electricity with synchronized cardioversion. What is Evabradine? Again, I talked about this in High Yield Facts Part 1. There are some random kind of one-off medications, not commonly used in real life, not commonly used in the hospital, but they do sometimes come up on step three. So I do want to include them here to make sure if there is a question, you'll get the answer immediately. You'll get that question right, and you'll be able to move on. So evabradine is a medication that is used to treat chronic CHF. It works by inhibiting the SA node, decreasing the heart rate, decreasing myocardial oxygen demand, and it is used to treat chronic CHF. To go along with that, what is the most unique adverse effect of evabradine use? This is an interesting one. It's going to be transient excess brightness of vision. For some reason, this is something that's really testable, really the only notable thing about evabradine. It's also called luminous phenomena, and it's basically these bright spots that can occur in vision or bright circles around lights. Really no other medication causes an adverse effect like this, which is probably why it's so testable. So just know that association. Evabradine can cause this transient excess brightness of vision. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Click here on the left to watch USMLE Step 3 High Yield Facts Part 1. Click here on the right to watch my other series, Comlex Level 3 High Yield Facts also very high yield for USMLA Step 3, so I definitely recommend checking that out. And of course, be sure to subscribe to receive all of these videos. Thank you for watching. I will catch you in the next one.